Alors, euh, Nick Dune, are you here? Hello. Hello. I, well, well, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, so, Nick Dune, you are a professor, executive director of Imagination Lancaster uh, University, where, and you're also chair of the urban design uh, section, right? Um, you are the senior fellow of the Institute for the Social Futures, and where you also lead research in the future of cities and urbanism. Your work responds to the contemporary city as a series of system flows and processes, and uh, you explore um, the nature of urban space. You publish uh, many books related to architecture and urbanism um, and papers, and you publish in several uh, international collaborative work in UK, China, and Ukraine. Voilà. And today uh, you will talk about noc nocturnal spaces, rediscovering an architecture of darkness. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Javier, for the introduction. Right. <laughs> Are we okay? We can all see that, I guess. Great. Hello, everyone. Um, firstly, a huge thank you to Javier for the introduction, Roberto and his colleagues for the invitation to be able to contribute to this wonderful symposium. It's a genuine pleasure. Um, and the last two days have been fascinating. So thanks also to all the other speakers. I've really learned a lot. Secondly, of course, I'm very sorry not to be with you there in Geneva today. But sadly, as you all know, due to travel restrictions, it was just simply not possible on this occasion, perhaps another time. So let's return to perhaps the beginning of the symposium when Javier spoke of our shared attempt to better understand the evolution of the idea of architecture and night. And specifically, I'm interested in what this might mean for the contemporary city. Our relationship with the interplay of light and dark is fundamental to how most of us make sense of the world in a physical way, especially spatially and materially. But crucially, it also shapes our perceptions, meanings, values and cultural associations. Following the birth of artificial illumination, we have used it as a species to create light and as a result, sought to reduce, if not entirely eliminate, darkness. Across the history of different lighting technologies, the widespread growth in illumination has had significant impact upon darkness, often to the latter's detriment. And Wolfgang Schivelbusch, uh, in specific reference to nighttime artificial lighting, observes that perceptions of it throughout history have consistently merged the literal and symbolic, whereas Joam Schlaw points directly to the dominance of light over darkness in considering the urban night. And he says, our image of night in big cities is oddly enough determined by what the historians of lighting say about light. Only with artificial light, they tell us, do the contours of the nocturnal city emerge. The city is characterized by light. Yet I suggest today that the nocturnal city remains an enigma. I think it's still poorly understood and it requires new inquiries to examine the tensions and coexistent nature of light and dark. This presentation examines the city of Manchester in the UK, it's my home city, through its pioneering history of industrialization and subsequent phases of regeneration and gentrification in order to explore its contemporary urban landscape. But just before we get to that, it's worth briefly discussing, uh, which I'll talk about in the next few slides, how night, and in particular darkness, are framed in a more general sense. When we consider how our experiences of cities are shaped, we do not necessarily think about how light and dark are contested and in some instances, perhaps further sharpen existing inequalities. This example you can see on the screen here is of a 120 square meter advertisement screen that blocked out daylight to poverty hit families in a London apartment block for three years. It's since been taken down uh, after campaigners called for its removal, but for a while, the in-situ residents were unable to see daylight. You can see that image on the right. 
out of their windows and described feeling isolated and blocked out of everything by the advertisement, which was put up without their consent. By contrast, the over-illumination of poorer parts of cities, in particular social housing, is notable compared to the level of darkness measured in more affluent neighborhoods in some cities. And I guess this is a, an example of that in a way. So whereas artificial light at night has been shown to indicate labor, it's also important for us to recognize that the distribution of these lighting technologies is intertwined with issues of inequality in some cities. Now in the past, perhaps, in a lot of Western cities, the brightly lit commercial areas would have contrasted with the dark neighborhoods of the poor in which darkness quickly became a symbol and a determinant of urban differentiation. But of course, this situation is complex. An alternative use, perhaps more recent use of light at night is opposite in this kind of application. So rather than being relatively absent, it is conspicuous by its overabundance. Lighting in social housing in some cities aims for maximum visibility for better CCT surveillance, with only more affluent neighborhoods having access to darkness. For example, certainly in London and here in Manchester, the, the social housing estates are immediately recognizable by their bright, cold light from the tall masts. And yet the night, especially the urban night, has long been associated with pleasure, transgression, and freedom. This can take many forms, but may frequently be a form of pleasure seeking, as you can see in this photo from Manchester a few years ago now, which uh, unintentionally perhaps appears like a work of Renaissance art in its composition, but this was very much not a staged photograph. It was taken on New Year's Eve, as you can see nearly five years ago. But the expectation of pleasure at night is a counterpoint to daytime activities, which are generally understood as relating to everyday worlds of work, education and care. But we also know that those everyday activities, you know, such as convenience shopping, going to the gym, have gradually expanded into the early morning or late into the evening, if not completely around the clock. Now, Scenes such as the one shown here from five years ago, perhaps seem weirdly distant from us now as the coronavirus pandemic has physically manifest itself in different ways through forms of lockdown, restriction and curfew. And until recently, the need and desire to manage and control the urban night led to a very clear spatialization of its economy, driven by practices of consumption, entertainment. But in response to the culture of convenience in contemporary lifestyles, new platforms are emerging that expand consumption possibilities at night and people increasingly ask for services that of course, other people have to work for at night. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the nighttime economy and issues of labor, safety, security, entertainment, etc remain the dominant area of inquiry for night studies, even though it's a multidisciplinary field. But, you know, as designers gathered here today, I think we can go beyond this and ask what might a nocturnal urbanism look like and what role might interior architecture perform in this endeavor? So in my attempt to respond to this question, I'm going to take you back in time by a couple of centuries or so. And specifically, we're gonna look at the context of my home city of Manchester, where I'm talking to you from today. As the crucible for the Industrial Revolution, Manchester has widely been recognised as the world's first industrial city. Growing as it did from a market town with a population of less than 10,000 at the beginning of the 18th century, to a population of 89,000 by the end of the century. But this population growth brought with it extremely poor and dense living conditions for many of the city's inhabitants. In 1798, George and Adam Murray completed the first phase of their steam-powered urban cotton mill in Ancoats, the first suburb 
to integrate housing and industry. When completed in 1806, the complex housed two separate cotton spinning mills, two warehouses, preparation and office ranges, all arranged around a central quadrangle. Now to give you some idea of the importance of that complex, the Murray Mills development, um, it had visitors traveling from the rest of the UK, Europe and the US to witness this huge complex of housing powered machinery and illuminated by gas. Parallel to this development in the adjacent town of Salford, the first gas street lighting in, world, in the world illuminated part of Chapel Street and the Phillips and Lee factory. This deployment of lighting technology, as we know, was to transform the world since it transferred and reframed the working day to a non-stop continually functioning place where the previous relationship between labor and time were shattered. Through his discussion of Arkwright's cotton mills by night, the painting you can see here by Joseph Wright of Derby around 1782, Jonathan Crary in his book 24 seven, which uh, a number of speakers have referred to over the last couple of days, makes clear that it is not simply the unusual site of a large brick building within a countryside setting that makes the image so strange. But in addition, he identifies, most unsettling, however, is the elaboration of a nocturnal scene in which the light of a full moon illuminating a cloud-filled sky coexists with the pinpoints of windows lit by gas lamps in cotton mills. For it is here, in this moment, that the artificial lighting of the factories announces its victory over the long-held light-dark cycle and circadian rhythms that had previously connected time and work. Pivotal to this endless labor was the, the very necessary need for constant energy production to power the machinery. The use of coal uh, was essential to this process with all the attendant environmental and health hazards that contribute to significant, contributed to significant commentators of the period, such as the historian Thomas Carlyle, decrying the condition of England and using sooty Manchester, which was every whit as wonderful, as fearful, unimaginable as the oldest Salem or prophetic city as testament. Meanwhile, the squalid and dark landscapes that the industrialized city created provided fertile ground for numerous writers, including Benjamin Disraeli, Elizabeth Gaskell, and Charles Dickens, the latter creating Coketown in his novel Hard Times as the very epitome of human misery within soot-covered brick buildings. Now there's an interesting point to be made here about the impact of energy production upon the light and darkness of its surrounding context. You can see this very murky image here from around 1870. The soot produced by the coal burning furnaces to power the machinery around them was airborne and it quickly built up on the surfaces of the buildings across the city and beyond. As Alexis de Tocqueville, when visiting Manchester in 1835 reported, a sort of black smoke covers the city. The sun seen through it is a disc without rays. And under this half daylight, 300,000 human beings are ceaselessly at work. A thousand noises disturb this dark, damp labyrinth, but they are not at all the ordinary sounds one hears in great cities. Within his account of his seven day trip to the city, de Tocqueville relates the extremes of the Manchester experience and the paradox that lay at the heart of its industrial success. So this nascent industrialization accelerated an energy production and artificially lit landscape that was subsequently much replicated and extended around the world in lots of other places. Whilst the conditions for working class people reached perhaps rock bottom in Manchester for the time, its role as a blueprint for the modern city proved more the dominant pattern of development than as an exception 
as the drivers of industrial capitalism swept around the world during the remainder of the 19th century and early 20th century. The blackened architecture in Manchester would remain for many years. And you can see here the city art gallery designed by Sir Charles Barry and constructed 1824 to 1835. These material deposits would serve to recall the city's dark history as its grandest buildings were coated with soot. Although furnished with some spectacular Victorian architecture, the coal fires and smoke from the nearby industry almost embalmed many of the city's landmarks black prior to the Clean Air Act of 1956, which helped reduce pollution. Having laid claim as the first industrial city in the world, in the first half of the 20th century, Manchester could arguably also have been the dirtiest, as its buildings and streets were filthy and dark. And this resultant blanket of soot produced a city of light and darkness that was dramatic, unified and uncanny. Now, the implementation of the Clean Air Act of 1956 quickly removed the smog that was airborne in the city. But as you can see here from some of these images across the, the mid and late 60s, it still took a number of years, in some cases, several decades before the city's architecture was returned to its original state. So this was a very gloomy city to be in and around. So either by cleaning or the soot very gradually being washed off by the rain, there are a couple of examples of Manchester's architecture of darkness that still remain um, in the present day. Now, by this term, architecture of darkness, I'm referring to a twofold aspect of the city's architectural landscape. Firstly, the literal transformation of the built environment due to this layer of material deposit. And at the moment, this present moment, two blackened buildings from the industrial era stand as architectural testaments to Manchester's atmospherically darkened past, namely the interior courtyards of Alfred Waterhouse's Town Hall, which you can see here. And then there's another building, 22 Lever Street by Smith, Woodhouse and Willoughby. But secondly, and I think perhaps less obviously, the darkened built environment also provided a specific context for Manchester's subsequent architecture to be de designed for. So I've already shown you in the last uh, couple of slides, some examples of the former, you know, those buildings that have been covered in material deposits. But in, in relation to the second category of an architecture of darkness, I would like to share this example of the district bank headquarters by Casson and Condor completed in 1969. Now the idea of grandeur in Mancunian architecture was prevalent since the 1860s because of its boom during the Industrial Revolution, which resulted in an architecture that was felt needed to reflect the city's significance in terms of status, power, and wealth. And the architects, Casson and Condor of this project referred to grandeur, discipline, toughness, and dignity as being representative of Manchester and the sort of qualities that should be aspired to for this kind of proposal. And their proposal was the winner of a by invitation only architectural competition. The unusual striking faceted form had been the result of a study of rights of light in the adjacent streets and buildings, with the final form being likened by Casson to a lump of coal. Now, if we look slightly closer at the external facade of the building, uh, you can see that textural pattern with those different elements of, of, of black and brown moving across it. And that's because it actually comprises of panels of hand-tooled, vertically ribbed, dark cladding of Swedish granite. And that, that material was deliberately chosen. It was specified by the architects to absorb the soot that still clung around the city and its buildings. It was also believed that this dark material brought a kind of appropriate seriousness and symbolic power to the bank's northern headquarters. But of course, it's not all like that. 
um, you know, inside the building, you have a very different setup. And what is happening here is you've got the hard brilliance in comparison to the external envelope, which is dark and it's still gathering bits of soot. You've got what they referred to as the hard brilliance of the banking hall. Um, and, you know, the members of the public would be the actors themselves. They would go up a tapering staircase and arrive uh, on this podium, which was very, very austere, actually, brilliantly white. Uh, and so you had this real idea of the interplay between light and dark, mass and void, uh, sort of the protection of wealth, and then this openness of light. And rather than cutting a ribbon when this building was open, um, the lady in question that uh, signified the open of the building simply switched on a light. Now, if we fast forward a few decades to the 21st century, you know, we now understand cities as dynamic entities of material and immaterial flows, processes and systems. And architecture is often understood as the material, sometimes literally concrete facts of the built environment. Its presence and function reflect the values of the society that produce it. But however, no matter how stable our buildings may appear, they are constantly changing inside and outside through the effects of weather, occupation, aging, and of course, light and darkness. Manchester, like many places around the globe, is also, I would suggest, a city of disappearances certainly in terms of its nightscapes and nocturnal ambiences. The view you can see here on the screen no longer exists. That's because since early 2014, Manchester is, Manchester's City Council announced its intention to roll out the replacement of 56,000 sodium lamps with light emitting diode lamps, LEDs, and have slowly been replacing these sodium street lamps. So it's important to state that this loss is not absolute, it's maybe not forever, but direct experience of a current variety of darknesses is likely to be obstructed or at least hindered by the profusion of LED street lighting. But this planned power of completeness is also an illusion since the lighting technology is built over and responds to a longer history of partial infrastructures and contextual characteristics that shape its effects. This extensive replacement of streetlights from sodium lamps to LED ones has profoundly changed the ambiences of numerous places after dark. It's largely changing the exterior spaces of the urban environment, but inevitably these are entangled with the interiors of the city at night. For the last seven years, I have been documenting how these places have been changing across the city and the wider urban borough. So in order to capture some of the different ambiences of darknesses in Manchester and how they are changing, this work has led to many hundreds, maybe even thousands now, of hours night walking through nightscapes and the production of an archive of photographs, maps, and auto-ethnographic notes. You can see two examples here, almost the same site. They've got quite a different feel and tone using exactly the same uh, camera equipment, um, you know, just a few years apart. I'm not the first person to do this sort of thing. Um, in 1869, the journalist William Blanchard Gerald, together with French artist Gustave Dor, produced an illustrated record of the shadows and sunlight of London. They spent many days and nights exploring the capital, often protected by plainclothes policemen, and visited night refuges, cheap lodging houses, and the opium den described by Charles Dickens in the sinister opening chapter of his novel, The Mystery of Edwin Drood. So there's a history to this kind of work of people trying to understand what constitutes the city and its light and dark. Writing about gloom in the urban landscape, Tim Edensor provides a robust argument for embracing it and says, rather than being lamented, the re-emergence of urban darkness, although not akin to the medieval and early modern gloom that pervaded city space, might be conceived as an enriching 
and a re-enchantment of the temporal and spatial experience of the city at night. Now, I think this relational understanding between light and dark is crucial to how we might conceive of better ways to design for and engage with our urban places at night. As our cities, not least Manchester, seek to evolve into 24 hour places, reducing further the different types of atmospheres, lights and darknesses, seems contrary to the increased diversity of their populations, cultures, social meanings and values, a kind of one size fits all type of nightscape emerging. But it's hard to know what is lost, especially if you've never experienced it. So since 2016, I've been leading groups of people on collective night walks around the greater Manchester city region to share with them different nocturnal ambiences so they can gain first-hand encounters of how the quality and quantity of lighting in these places mediate experiences of the built environment. We sometimes done drawings, written short texts, or used our bodies in different arrangements to explore our entanglements with darkness. And that image you can perhaps see on the, on the right there, I mean, that photograph doesn't do it justice. When you're stood in that space, that underpass under a motorway, it feels as if you're in a James Turrell installation. It's really quite phenomenal. Since March 2020 and during the ongoing pandemic, I have been learning how other people make sense and use the nocturnal city in ways that support what they are doing, whether through labor, respite, or other activities. This image taken by myself during the second national lockdown shows a security guard, you can just about see in that little cubicle in front of the big building. It was one of only five people I encountered during six hours in the city centre that night. The others were a street cleaner and three young women returning home from work. Now, much of the work that I've produced to date on, on darkness and places has been anthropocentric, and it's not really engaged with the non-humans who might contribute the composition of the identity of urban places after dark. And some of the work I've been doing earlier this year is focused on seeking to develop a better understanding of more than human landscapes. The plethora of new agendas promoting health and well-being in cities are often accompanied by visions of clean, green and daylight urban environments. So of specific interest for the work I've been doing here is the invisibility of urban natures at night. And I've spoken and written about this aspect elsewhere. So today I'm gonna to focus more on where I think design can play a role in the nocturnal city. So this is another image taken the same night when I was out having this walk in the second lockdown. Surely as architects, interior architects and urban designers, we can do better than this. But the question of how we design with darkness also requires us to reconsider fundamental practices because if night refers to the ephemeral, the fragile, the spontaneous, you know, how do you construct um, something for it without distorting it. And as Armengard et al. discuss, you know, to observe the cityscape by night means to ask oneself about nocturnal design values. And I've spoken previously about the concept of dark design, which really I've defined as those principles and practices that aim to design with darkness rather than against it. Richard Kelly, one of the pioneers of architectural lighting design, drew on his background in stage lighting to introduce a scenographic perspective for architectural lighting. Challenging the engineering mindset that dominated lighting design in the mid 20th century, he introduced three principles, vocal glow, ambient luminescence, and play of brilliance. Revisiting these principles from the contemporary situation of working with rather than against darkness. The diversity and subtleties of lighting promoted by Kelly can be seen to have been quickly lost as urban centers in particular drove artificial illumination into a competing arena where brightness and power became prized over other 
lighting characteristics. And we've all experienced that because we walk down streets and this is trying to grab your attention and this is, you know, but this situation's not gone unnoticed by lighting professionals. As Edward Bartholomew succinctly observed, as I gaze upon overlit lobbies and malls, I sense that what is being lit is not the space, but merely a fear, legal or otherwise, of the consequence of darkness. But is this all a city at night can be? I think critical to understanding nocturnal ambiences is acknowledging the dynamic qualities of the elements that form and shape them in material, spatial and temporal terms. The potentialities and capacities of nocturnal ambiences to provide a wider array of sensations and interactions than are often present in urban landscapes at night requires methods through which to rediscover and I suspect reimagine our relationships with darkness. And this is where you come in, of course. This is where design can provide a valuable role. By developing new visions and interventions for nocturnal ambiences, interior architecture, urban design, architecture, you know, we can share atmospheres that promote positive behavior for human and non-human sensitivities to be designed with darkness rather than against it. And this example of guerrilla lighting under the arches in Castlefield involved 80 people with torches and color, color filters to come along and essentially got them to all turn the torches on uh, for 30 to 40 seconds in different variations. And the transformation of this space from being unlit and lit was very effective. I mean, it's so simple in its idea, but it really demonstrated how lit, how light can transform a space. And this is what we do all the time as interior architects and, and other designers. Subluminal was an event devised by a group of design professionals from Northwest England to transform the usual sensory apprehension of buildings. In this case, the John Rylands Library, again in Manchester. In the cavernous reading room, colored and white lights highlighted key features, further emphasizing the surrounding gloom. Walking along a dark corridor lined with leather bound books, which was usually inaccessible to the public, a flickering light briefly illuminated the surroundings. And the experience was accompanied by evocative sounds, including a welcoming introduction from the statue of industrialist John Rylands himself, ambient drones and whispers, and then the throbbing bass notes that spread through the subterranean passageways. At points, the gloom inside contrasted with the light from outside. So what you can see outside of the windows in both these images is the general city uh, street lighting, you know, the lighting that's outside of the buildings that shone through the ornamental windows. So unlike a cinema and other enclosed environments we've heard about over the last two days, this is very much connected to what's going on outside in some way. But by completely defamiliarizing and re-enchanting the library through the deployment of sounds, illumination and darkness, Subluminal produced a statement about the potential of light and sonic design to enrich the sensory experience of place. What can we learn from such encounters? The boundaries between interior and exterior can certainly become blurred at night. And I think this represents a significant opportunity for us as designers. As building construction has largely become compressed, flattened, we don't have deep facades so much anymore, a lot of it is steel and glass, you know, we're losing some of those opportunities for what interior architecture and architecture can do. But walking through Manchester at night, the composition of the city slowly shifts through the different lights and darknesses, reflecting the history of its lighting energy landscape. Although historical accounts of lighting are focused on the routine circumstances of the urban night, I think more recent studies have redressed this by providing investigations into unique, temporary and performative illuminations. And I think there might be an important overlap between these two areas of inquiry. That we can go and enjoy our nocturnal urban landscape, perhaps improvisionally, without recourse to consumerism, suggests that by engaging with the every night rather than the every day, we might find ourselves open to new forms of experience and place. 
Although there's an increasing amount of research across various disciplines related to um, the notion of reciprocity between light and dark being essential to each, there are also historical clues to how we might learn to embrace this. The Japanese novelist Junikiro Tanizaki, in his seminal 1933 meditation on his country's culture in praise of shadows, which Muriel was talking about earlier today, highlighted the importance of this coexistence when he observed, if light is scarce, then light is scarce. We will immerse ourselves in the darkness and there discover its own particular beauty. And so thinking about this symposium and thinking about these ideas further, over the last few months, I've been documenting those places across the city at night that have the quality of a nocturnal room. That is, they feel enclosed on most sides and due to the combination of light, materiality, sound and smell, they form temporal sanctuary and offer different sensitizations of place. Recent shifts in understandings about darkness often offer an important opportunity for designers to shape the nocturnal world anew. As Claire Downey writes, by understanding how articulations of architecture, envelope, permeability, scale, edge, recess, influence nocturnal spatial practice, alternatives in buildings and lighting can be imagined. Okay, I'm nearly uh, about to, to finish now, so. When we think about the future of cities, it is difficult to ignore the many visions produced for urban places, which always show us clean, green and daylight environments. And when darkness is showed in visions for place, it's nearly always employed to shape the depiction of a foreboding future that is dystopic, dirty and dangerous. However, I contend that it is in the city at night where as designers, we can find fertile opportunity for imagining how places might change and for whom. If day is the rehearsal, night is the performance. It is the dark twin of the city in the most positive sense. Of course, it's both psychological and physical. The nocturnal city awaits our wonder and wonder. It's the temporary city where identity can be reinvented and this includes places and we've heard about nightclubs and other places over the last couple of days where we can have a very different identity than we might do out in the daytime. But I think in the urban shadowlands, the ghosts of the past city leak out of the city's cracks and pores and the future, you know, appears in fleeting glimpses. We get sneak peeks of what the city might become. To experience the city at night is to be immersed in a landscape of greater possibility than in the daytime. I, because I think the characteristics of place can appear more open and provisional than during the day. As light pollution now represents a global challenge, recognizing the diversity of interplay between light and dark is critical in moving towards an overall goal where its impacts on human and non-human bodies can be tackled in a local and situated way through creativity, commitment and action. I think this is our collective responsibility as designers to create and share alternatives. And as part of my work to show different qualities of interior and exterior places in the built environment at night, I've completely collaborated on a feature, I've recently collaborated on a feature film due to be released next year. And you can see a couple of stills from that here. Now more than ever, we all need to engage with reimagining the nocturnal city and its interior architecture beyond the narrow frame of the nighttime economy and move towards a nocturnal urbanism that is inclusive, equitable, convivial, ethical and quiet as much as it is also safe and supportive of biodiversity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much um, for your for your presentation. Do you have any question? Yeah. Okay. I have two, but I will let you start. No, 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 you go first. No, no, I want to say the presentation. Okay. 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 Okay.
Yeah, is it working? Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you very much for this great presentation for showing or showing me Manchester on another on, under another light. Uh, I have a question. One of the characteristic of um, I think today Manchester is the enormous construction of uh, high rise in the center, uh, especially due to financial fi financialization. And so there's two things with that. First, the, I was wondering if you look at building site, the, how the building sites are illuminated or not. And the other one, what happens when, the, because we know that a lot of these buildings will probably remain empty or, or will be by, by, bought by people who don't necessarily live in Manchester. So what, what happens at night when a lot of these uh, apartments are not uh, lit by? So what, what does it mean for the city to have this kind of architecture, which there is also in London, for example, where uh, apartments function more as investments than, than to live in, really? So what does it mean in terms of light and dark for the city? Sure, great question. Thank you. Um, I guess the first thing I'd say is, we probably all know in a lot of these contemporary cities, Manchester included, that form follows finance, right? Okay, so, um, so we're seeing a lot of um, investment from outside Manchester coming in, as, uh, as has been said by these skyscrapers. And that is doing two things. Firstly, we've got huge construction sites. I mean, Manchester itself, for those of you that have not been uh, able to visit yet, is actually quite a compact city centre. It's not a big city. And so you've got quite large sites, substantial sites being redeveloped with a lot of security lighting that, of course, uh, circles around these sites uh, in the way that we I discussed the social housing, you know, to basically deter would-be criminals that might uh, cause vandalism or, or steal building materials. So first of all, you have this kind of um, protective quality of additional, often very aggressive lighting, a lot of up lighting as well, which of course causes problems for non-human bodies um, uh, happening around, around the city at present. The other issue uh, in terms of the, the image of the city, if you, if you like, a lot of these, um, these towers, these skyscrapers are, are investments. So in the way that um, they're not necessarily um, occupied by people, uh, either in what we might call a more permanent way as residents, there's two things happening there. Either they're just left as an investment, so there's no one home, or um, they are sort of supporting and maybe even accelerating the idea of the city uh, within a nighttime economy of a place of transgression and pleasure seeking. So there's a lot of these apartments being rented out, particularly at weekends, but also during the week through Airbnb and other platforms where people are arriving with a certain expectation about what the city is and um, further supporting the nighttime economy. Um, interestingly, though, even in those even in those blocks that are that are largely abandoned, there are often lights put on some of the apartments, uh, certainly all the general floors, to give this image of the city, to give this idea of a successful city at night, which is quite a 20th century idea, actually. You know, I guess we think particularly about, um, you know, great cities like New York, particularly Manhattan and, and Paris and other cities, London, show using light as a form of, uh, you know, illustrating commercial activity, you know, success, power, wealth, et cetera. So these, these investments are for sure uh, quite profoundly changing the, the qualities of light and dark around the city. I mean, now we have a, a permanent uh, white aura across the city through all these LEDs and they're coming as much from the construction lights. The other thing that we see, of course, all the time is um, the, the red firefly type lights that are on top of these buildings to warn aircraft and other low flying uh, things uh, not to hit them. So it's, it's for sure changed a lot. Manchester didn't have many high buildings up until about 20 years ago. Huh? Okay, oh, Hilary, maybe she won. Um, thank you, Nick. That was utterly um, fascinating. I learned a great deal. Um, I remember those blackened, soot, sooted buildings from you know my younger years, and um, 
And of course, the soot didn't just fall on the buildings, it fell over the entire, you know, the air pollution affected the entire city. And I was just wondering if you knew anything about trees um, and whether I imagine there are also blackened trees, which I don't remember from my younger years. No, I mean, I, um, I was born in 1974, so I, I can remember the very tail end, really, of going into uh, the city centre with, with my parents. Um, there was a lot of buildings still quite dirty, not to the extent of the images I've shown there. A lot of them were, were cleaned up in the, in the 70s. Um, as, as you quite rightly say, Hillary, it fell on all surfaces. I mean, it was absorbed everywhere and um, would have appeared a very gloomy city, even in bright, quite bright days. But there's not much written about this. And I mean, perhaps people in the audience here or beyond, you know, this idea that you would design new buildings to fit in with that context is remarkable. I mean, I'm, I'm not aware of an example quite like that, that attempts to deal with the the, the kind of matter out of place, you know, uh, as, as Mary Douglas would talk about it, uh, attacks to these buildings and then think, I know we should design new buildings to kind of accommodate that. Um, but there's, there's very little in the Manchester archives that show um, the landscape in the years where there might be um, a lot of uh, soot maybe on more, um, not buildings, but um, not natural landscape, but the trees, et cetera, the parks. I mean, for sure, they must have been there uh, even even in a, in a smaller time frame, but I, I haven't found much evidence of it, but it's a really yeah. interesting point. Yeah, I mean, if I can just comment, um, I'm aware of some work in archaeology where people are, say, looking at dust in church and cathedral settings and, and that kind of turn, you know, Mary Douglas, you know, the idea of, of dirt and all of that work to, to look at the more microscopic or, you know, um, so I think it's really interesting. I think it'd be a really interesting angle. Thank you. I have maybe one question uh, for you. Um, you at the end, you you was uh, um, you talk a lot about the responsibility of designer, right? On uh, how we can design uh, light at night, and but I see that uh, we live a bit in a paradox as a designer because we, in the one side, we need to work with the fear and the security. Basically, a dark place is still a place of uh, of mystery, of darkness, of crime, of whatever. And the other side, uh, we need to work with um, uh, pollution, with a light pollution. And uh, when I saw your um, pictures of Manchester, actually, you in a one way you have this charming uh, sodium light uh, uh, postcard uh, view. And the other side, you have um, this contem contemporary international LED lights, airport lights, right? How, what will be, can you be more accurate on how, what will be the position of the designer between these two uh, contractable uh, city? Uh, <laughs> and I, honestly, I don't really know the answer and maybe you can uh, enlighten me if we can say. I'm not sure I know the answer. If I did, I wouldn't be presenting on it, but I can, I'll certainly have a go. Um, okay, you're totally right about the issues of darkness and safety and security. And I think, you know, I fully recognize that even when I'm going out at night doing this research on my own, I am a white male, uh, increasingly middle-aged, uh, wandering around, which comes with a, perhaps a certain set of privileges that is not necessarily available to everybody that could go out in the night and feel that way. So I should make very clear to all of you, I'm not a naturally brave person, right? Okay, so, uh, uh, you know, but, uh, but I think, you know, you actually don't need a lot of light. I think there are, there are questions about um, how much, how bright should our future be? And of course, light forms really important elements, as we've heard from multiple presentations over the last couple of days, about ideas of social gatherings, conviviality, entertainment. So I'm not suggesting we should turn everything off. Um, I think the danger is that light sometimes becomes shorthand for other issues. So here in the UK, uh, we've had two uh, terrible 
uh, tragic murders by by young women uh, in London, which happened at night. But so the, the natural response is to add more light in cities. But light doesn't make up for a for a vacuum in either policy that protects women's safety um, or, or or policing policy. Uh, and I think design. The reason I'm, I keep mentioning designers in this, and I realize you know it's it's without wishing to offend any of the co-presenters here at this symposium, because I realize many of them may not be designers, but. Design has largely been left out of this discussion. You know, the, 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 a lot of the research that I see in, in, in under the umbrella of night studies is, is done by wonderful people in the humanities and across the arts, but design is not featured very much. And I think we can explore that whole spectrum uh, from the city to the room in different ways exploring different ambiences, working out those different arrangements and qualities. The big problem that Manchester's facing, as lots of cities are facing, is they've rolled out this replacement uh, of lighting based on cost efficiency, which makes sense. They want, they want to save money. But in, in this case, it's the worst, cheapest, nastiest, white-blue LEDs that they're, that they're putting in. And there's a lot of studies that say just because you increase light levels, you don't reduce crime and you don't improve safety and security. So I think it's about multiple perspectives. Um, I wouldn't want what I'm doing to be transferred and put in other cities. I think actually that's where we've gone wrong. We've imported ideas of light as cleanliness and whiteness and brightness across many different urban contexts at night without really maybe understanding the different characters and qualities of place and I think we actually need further inquiries uh, by people such as yourselves to understand the diversity because we, we're beginning to understand the cost of light in terms of human health in terms of that of biodiversity the impact on the planet but I'm not sure we're truly understanding the value of darkness thank you okay uh Maybe uh, I can react to that. Uh, thanks to thanks for your presentation, and thank you all for all the presentations we have seen throughout the entire symposium. I think that actually the presentation you made on the case of Manchester uh, holds uh, a lot of uh, common points with the things uh, which have been discussed this morning uh, after the presentation by Lucia Halon. Um, particularly, I'm uh, referring to the to the question about who controls light uh, or artificial light when it comes to urban environments, actually. Uh, this is a critical question, I think, uh, because uh, obviously daylight, sunlight is a default uh, system of uh, illumination when it comes to urban environment. However, artificial light uh, has uh, a kind of an underlying kind of system of uh, artificial, technological and societal uh, control behind that. And uh, one of your slides was uh, mentioning uh, uh, one topic that has been discussed this morning, guerrilla, guerrilla lighting no? as a mechanism of resistance, but also participatory, collective, and uh, maybe even more democratic way of constructing uh, urban identity at, at night. No? So uh, according to, uh, to, to your opinion, and uh, the, the opinion of the rest of the, of the colleagues, uh, who, who controls artificial light when it comes to urban environments? And uh, what are the mechanisms to uh, create uh, nocturnal urban spaces which are more uh, participatory or at least the result of uh, collective decision making? So to say. Okay, um, I will just say something, but I'm very mindful there's lots of wonderful people gathered here that may also want to speak. I guess what I would say, and I think this is a very positive thing, um, although not many positive things came out of uh, the pandemic, certainly in the UK, people are generally not necessarily that activated about the spaces and places where they live. And I think one of the things the pandemic certainly did was bring that attention to someone's home, their neighborhood, their access to space outside, very sharp. Suddenly inequalities that already exist seemed a lot stronger. And so I think the idea of people taking more ownership and participation in the places and spaces where they live, work and play is becoming further and higher up the agenda. It, it's making things more sustainable and resilient as we go forward. 
but still the narrative is largely about places in the daytime. And I think it should be around the clock. I'm not suggesting communities are out 24 seven, suggesting that we think about really what a nocturnal uh, urbanism looks like and how that works for different people, different communities in different places. There's not a one size uh, fits all here. And I guess just by one very quick example, there's some fascinating work that's been done by Casper uh, Lang Ebensgaard down in London, where he's been working with community groups to challenge the standardization and regulatory framework. So basically seeing what the lighting policy says, British standards, I'm sure like most lighting standards for a lot of countries is very uniform. It's very clear in terms of its regulations, but they've been finding um, not necessarily loopholes, but ways in which they can creatively work and reinterpret that to find lighting that's more suitable where people still feel safe, but it's not this kind of uniform, perhaps slightly draconian and certainly very unimaginative um, effect uh, that, that produces nocturnal nights, you know, nightscapes that are very um, general uh, and not very enticing to, to, to people to be in.